Hello, Sondo. Hello, Kevin. In the last few episodes, we've been talking about learning to do. Uh, FM Alexander's concept of learning to do. It's the name of one of the chapters. So what exactly is learning to do? And is that what's happening in modern Alexander Technique schools? Because it doesn't seem like they're learning to do. It seems maybe they're having something done to them rather than learning to do something. Yes. Uh, yes, I think I haven't, go I haven't been uh, clear enough about uh, this conception of... Uh, of the, well, the problem of our conception in learning to do. Uh, last week, uh, if you remember, we discussed this idea that uh, uh, people tighten, people in doing things, people tighten. And uh, that's the general idea in the, the modern Alexander Technique. There was this, uh, I, I took, uh, uh, well, this uh, excerpt from uh, the writings of a modern Alexander teacher. And he said that uh, we must try to inhibit this tightening, that inhibition uh, in our conception. We don't realize that we are tightening, so uh, we need to stop tightening. And I started to uh, comment on this idea, saying that uh, for me, this was, uh, this was not the Alexander Technique. Uh, it passed for the Alexander Technique, but it's certainly not, not it. Uh, the problem is not to inhibit the tightening. Uh, the problem was uh, for me very different. It was the idea that um, uh, we have to deal with incorrect actions, incorrect preliminary acts in any activity. This can be seen uh, on a video recording. And this is uh, where we want to apply a procedure for learning to do. And uh, I believe that uh, Alexander uh, demonstrated that there can be different ways of learning to do. And uh, his way of learning to do was quite uh, revolutionary and still is. And uh, the notion of having Alexander Technic lessons would be uh, better align on this idea that it's possible to consciously perform a coordination. That's what I want to explain today. So uh, let's start with, uh, as always, I want to share my screen so that you will see where is this is all starting from. So we have here a sentence, a little paragraph, that comes from the first uh, edition of the first book. It's a very early writing of Alexander. Very, very curiously, this uh, part of the chapter has been, uh, has been put out in the next edition. So in the edition, most Alexander teacher read, uh, there, is, there is this sentence does not uh, exist. We are going to have to ask ourselves why it has been taken out. But for the moment, let's have a look at it. Alexander is um, explaining that his technique is a um, procedure for learning to do. He is, uh, is based on instructions, verbal instructions. These instructions are instruction that, uh, of course, the teacher is going to give to the pupil. But uh, the real idea is uh, after the lesson, when the teacher is gone, the student will have only the instruction to work with. And uh, he will start giving himself the instruction the teacher has taught him. So. Uh, these instructions for Alexander are separated in two categories. That is what he's explaining here. And uh, I use exactly the same principle. I give my students two categories of instructions for them to use in order to do something. So here is what Alexander is saying. It's in front of your eyes. I may briefly explain orders concerning definite inhibition by stating that the teacher will have to deal with incorrect movements unconsciously performed. 
These movements, occurring at the moment when the teacher dictates the orders, the conscious guiding orders, necessary to bring about coordination of the different parts of the mechanism, assert themselves and become primary and hinder the performance of the correct and coordinated movements as ordered. It is therefore as necessary to order the inhibition of incorrect and unconsciously performed act as to give orders, conscious guiding orders, which will secure the coordinated use of the mechanism involved. I think this is central. Well, I, I, at least uh, you, you may consider that this is central to my way of teaching. So, we have uh, suddenly uh, the position of the teacher and the t position of the teacher is different from the position of the students. The teacher is observing the visual demonstration of a person that is, uh, well, making what we call a gesture. Well, in the Alexander Technique, very often we use a simple gesture. We have a, a person standing. This is already a gesture, but in order to really obtain the necessary ingredients, we ask the person to perform uh, a, a real equilibrium task that we call going from standing to sitting. I will explain that in a minute. So the person is uh, the subject, it's the pupil, and uh, the teacher is there observing the ocular demonst Alexander talks about the ocular demonstration that the pupil is doing in performing the equilibrium gesture. Well, it's an equilibrium gesture. We, we have to construct an experiment where the pupil's poise is uh, called to enter into action. We want to see whether the pupil is uh, capable of organizing different parts of uh, the different movements and uh, keep his equilibrium. So when uh, the pupil is going to perform the gesture, the pupil uh, apparently performs incorrect movement. Alexander said that uh, these incorrect movements are unconsciously performed. This is easy to, to check and to assess. Uh, it's just, it's simple. You, you film a person going to sit. And after that, uh, you ask the person whether the person has uh, made some movements or not. So you have here one of my students uh, and uh, I've, I requested the student to start from a sitting position. Then uh, it seemed quite logical to ask her to, to bring the lower uh, torso above the chair. It's a safety measure. Uh, when you sit, you have to sit onto something that is backward. So it is necessary to have in mind that, uh, well, for you to, to be safe, when you sit down, your lower torso must be above the chair. It's quite logical. Well, there, there is uh, a little trick, uh, is that I, I wanted the person to be capable of, in fact, creating different, very clear stages. The first one is between picture one and picture two. Uh, it's the, I'm asking the pupil to create a new flexion of the knees that is contrary to her habits. She has habits of movements and for her, bending the knees uh, include, includes bending the ankle systematically. Uh, at first, she could not bend the knees without bending the ankle first. On this image, she is uh, already capable more or less of inhibiting the bending of the ankle that brings the knees forward as a first gesture. Uh, this is not without some difficulties because already we can see that her hands are moving in space, they are moving forward and uh, it may not be evident to the people that are looking at this video but I suspect that she's also lifting the shoulders backward, tightening the muscle of the neck because of that, well, movement of the shoulders and movement of the arms. 
she will uh, at first not realize that she is uh, lifting uh, the shoulders. For us, for for her, it's something we see, but for her, it's something that uh, is not conscious. She's not deliberately sending the hands forward. She's not. She's not been asked to send the hands forward. Uh, she's not been asked to raise the shoulders and tighten the muscles of the neck. Of course, for this is what Alexander calls a uh, subconscious act. It's part of a, a way of going to sit, but it's not something she has decided upon. It's something that happens. And uh, when you ask the person, the person is not really aware of these movements happening before watching the video, of course. After watching the video, I can point and, and say, yes, uh, apparently you are uh, you're going back as requested with the back. So your back is going back, but uh, it's it may not ob be obvious again, but uh, she's not touching the chair anymore with the back of the knees. She hasn't been capable of, of performing the conscious plane. Yes. Then uh, what is requested, and you see there are there is a grid on the image. What is requested of her is quite simple. I asked her to sit on the very front of the chair. I said to her, you're going to be in flexion. And from that second phase, we are going to enter into a third phase. And the third phase is now to uh, touch the chair with the lower torso and touch the chair in such a way as to land on the front of the chair. Why is that? Well, it's, uh, it's again for uh, an equilibrium or safety reason, if you want. Uh, human beings can uh, send their lower back at a certain distance from the from the heels and no more if you go too far back you're not going to sit on the chair you are going to fall onto the chair the we are very interested in the capacity of the pupil to keep the equilibrium meaning that uh, for Alexander, the definition of equilibrium is very simple. He say, if you can stop the movement at uh, the gesture at any moment in time, it means that you are capable of inhibiting, you are capable of stopping the movement. If you cannot, uh, well, you are not the master of the movement. The movement masters you. And it's a, a it's certainly what's happening and that's what I'm going to explain to the student between picture three and picture four. Um, we see that um, at first I asked her to try and inhibit the movement of the knees forward and that she understood. And then it was clear that her knees should move forward. But uh, apparently between picture three and picture four, uh, the knees are not moving forward in a way as requested. The knees are moving back and as a result, she cannot. But in fact, fall back. It's not uh, possible for her to stop the movement between image three and image four. There is a moment where she's falling. This explains from the start why uh, she's uh, raising the hands, raising the arms. The question that Alexander is pointing to is um, uh, incorrect movements. We, we are discussing incorrect movements. What are incorrect movements. Well, in the example I've shown, uh, we can ask different questions. We can ask, is it necessary to lift the shoulders and the hands and the arm in space in order to stay, in order to go back with the back? Necessary, it's not. It does not uh, really uh, help to direct the movements of the parts of the torso by lifting the arm makes it more difficult. It's clear that uh, these movements of the shoulders toward the toward the top of uh, uh, the sternum and the top and toward the heads are going to tighten the neck, are going to make everything cramped, and uh, the, it's not going to improve the breathing system at all. So we can consider that these movements are incorrect for uh, the idea of going to sit, but they are also incorrect for the good functioning of the mechanism of the torso. Uh, any tightening of the shoulder and neck is going to affect the breathing system.
as soon as we can say this, we can say these are incorrect movements. These are not movements I dislike. These are not movements that are incorrect on a moral uh, basis. These are incorrect movements on a functioning basis. That's what uh, Alexander is saying. So, Alexander says that uh, these movements are occurring at the movement that the teacher dictates the orders. They also uh, appear when the pupil dictates the order to herself. It's uh, the same idea. Because, uh, uh, for example, in the lesson I give, I do not touch the pupil. The tutor pupil is far away in her own home. And uh, at the moment of starting uh, the sitting down procedure, it's obvious that uh, she is ordering the movements. Well, I can say that she is ordering the movements because I can I note that uh, a habit of releasing the ankle is not uh, apparent, which means that she has intentions. These intentions are of, uh, obviously not the habitual intention. These are intellectual intention that she has taken from the orders, from the conscious verbal orders that she's been given. So, so in, in this case, I say that uh, this person is, as Alexander says, um, dictating the orders to herself. And so, um, we, at the moment, are discussing what is happening, but you, Alexander points to another factor. He says that, uh, what are the orders for? The orders here are to bring about a coordination of the different parts of the mechanism. So, uh, I, I have to make a, a modification for me to understand this sentence. You cannot coordinate different parts. It's, it doesn't make any sense. For me, the only thing you can coordinate is the movements of the parts. And the only thing I ask the pupil to coordinate is the movement of the parts. I want the pupil to coordinate the movement of the mechanism of the torso going back in space above the chair without, in fact, releasing the ankle and letting the knee go forward from the first, from the word go, from the moment she's standing to the moment she goes into bending. And um, of course, uh, the performance of the correct and coordinated movements uh, are ordered. It's, uh, it's obvious that uh, in this case, the orders are about the performance of coordinated movements. I do not invent this idea. I do not uh, create my own interpretation of the, of the text. Uh, I just look at what is written, and what is written is that uh, Alexander is, uh, is clearly stating at that moment that the orders are um, the orders that are going to guide the performance of coordinated movements. Well, obviously, in this, I have taken a text that has been taken out of the books. Most people who have read the books have not seen these, um, these sentences. And uh, of course, the question is, why did Alexander take uh, this uh, central piece that the orders are orders of performance of the correct and coordinated movements? That we want to order the performance of coordinated movements. And you will see that this is central to understanding what Alexander is saying, well, 40 years later in his last book, in his chapter, where he's talking about learning to do. Otherwise, if, if, you, if you cannot uh, relate these two elements, um, it really does not make sense to talk about learning to do in the Alexander Technique. It's, uh, so in the modern Alexander Technique, there is uh, very little about learning to do. Nobody is commenting on the, the fourth book. Uh, learning to do is, uh, is something that is totally deprecated. We don't learn to do. 
And even when you look at uh, uh, the modern Alexander Technique training, so you have uh, some pupils, some students that are coming for three years and they are uh, coming to learn to teach the Alexander Technique. Well, in fact, uh, I've been there, I've seen it, I've seen, I've visited many uh, modern Alexander Technique training centers, which were all like mine. And uh, what the four hours, the four, four, four and a half hours did, uh, that are happening every single day during the week for, uh, well, three, three years, uh, what are they dedicated to? Well, they are dedicated to learning to do uh, the hands-on manipulation how to place your hands on a person, uh, how to organize yourself in order to place your hands on somebody. I will call that for the moment uh, learning to do. You are, you, are, you are really learning to do. And um, about this, uh, Alexander, uh, these are, <laughs> I have some texts that have not been suppressed from the, not been taken away. Uh, it's, it's obvious that uh, Alexander is clear about, uh, about this fact. He says, now the narrowing and arching of the back, already referred to, are, the exact, are exactly opposite to what is required by nature. And that which is obtained in reeducation, coordination and readjustment, widening of the back and a more, a more normal and extended position of the spine. And uh, why is it central to learn to do this? It's because this, this condition of the back are first secured, the neck and arm will no longer be stiffened and the other faults will be eradicated. This is the center of the means whereby principle is that uh, we are doing unwanted movement with the different parts of the torso. As a result of the movements of the different parts of the torso, we will see that the neck, arms and legs will be stiffened. And these are unwanted consequences that are affecting the functioning of the whole cell. So when uh, the modern Alexander Technique teacher are posting images on the net, uh, I look at, uh, well, of course, uh, the lengthening and the widening of the back that is uh, brought into activity when they are putting their hands on uh, their students. They have learned to move their hands, they have learned to organize their torso, but uh, learning to do is not... Uh, is deprecated, as I said, and as a result, uh, of course, there is this this idea that uh, it's not important how you uh, well lengthen or arch the back. It's it's not uh, you can have perfect good use even when seen arching the back. This is how the modern Alexander technique sees. Uh, the uh, idea of learning to do. You don't learn to do, you learn to uh, get the correct sensory impression. If you feel free while you are performing uh, these acts, while you're doing the movement of the hands forward, or you're moving to sit and you're mo doing the movement that is projecting you in the back of the seat when uh, it was requested to sit at the front, it's not the matter, it's not important. Uh, so, th of course, the fact that uh, uh, the sentence has been taken out uh, of uh, the first book matters because uh, nobody understands that the directions that we use most of the time in the modern Alexander technique, let the neck be free to let the head go forward and up to let the back lengthen and widen are consequences. Uh, the neck uh, activity uh, is a consequence of the condition of the back. So if you don't learn to do the first uh, coordination, the coordination of the mechanism of the torso, uh, the neck and arm will be stiffened. And this is uh, obvious that when you look at uh, uh, different m pictures that are 
published on the net as correct pictures of teacher uh, working or videos of teacher working, you see that, uh, of course, uh, it's impossible to arch the back and have the sternum so far back without tightening uh, all the muscles of the neck. And so the person is communicating to the student a, well, a very, very strong influence and that very strong influence is not a coordinated activity of the mechanism of the torso of the teacher. So, Alexander uh, put the, the fingers and he's not talking about the teachers of his, uh, of his training course because this is uh, uh, maybe just later. It's uh, the fourth book in the Universal Constant in Living. And uh, he's talking about parents that are sending them their children to school. And he talks to their parents and he draws their attention to the very bad use present is in the great majority of teachers today. And the parents quickly appreciate the bad example the teachers set to their pupil. For in such cases, the greater the teacher's influence over the pupil, the greater the danger of imitation affecting the child adversely during school hours. I have always recognized this. And that is why all teachers at the panic school, this is the, the little school Alexander, in fact, uh, uh, started. All teachers of the panic school have to become more or less proficient in employing the technique of conscious control in their own use of themselves before taking up their teaching work. And most of them have been through my three year training course for teachers. The first aim is to be good examples of use to their pupils. And the experience of having to apply the technique give them the standard with, by which to judge. So uh, we are uh, discussing learning to do and uh, learning to do here is uh, learning to coordinate the movements of the different parts of the torso in order to lengthen and widen, in order to have the neck free, and in order, of course, to demonstrate poise. And demonstrate poise not because a person is saying, I am really balanced, I am really uh, emotionally safe, uh, does not mean that the person is uh, has learned to do according to the Alexander Technique principles. The learning to do here uh, is um, about how you are able to give yourself verbal instructions, how you can obey these instructions um, in all sorts of activity. The, the idea um, that one uh, should uh, rely on an improved feeling, an improved sensory appreciation is, uh, is, is not the idea of uh, the Alexander Technique as I teach it. I do not teach uh, the improvement of the sensory appreciation as a model. Uh, the improvement of the sensory appreciation in the way uh, initial Alexander teaching teacher are uh, presenting the work is to, in fact, uh, consider it as a consequence, as a remote consequence of uh, little interest. Uh, even if your sensory appreciation has improved, which can be well demonstrated or can be compared on different videos, because uh, on one, you can, in fact, bypass the stimulation of the sensory appreciation. Well, uh, most of the time, it's not the point. Most of the time, the point is uh, being capable of making a difference between end gaining and means whereby. So this is uh, the point. It will be seen, therefore, that end gaining involves the conception of going of the procedure and procedure of going direct for an end without consideration as to whether the means whereby to be employed are the best 
for the purpose as to whether they should be substituted for these new and improved means whereby which in their employment will necessarily involve change in the manner of the self. This end gaining plan is one of trial and error and it proved more or less successful when man's manner of using himself was satisfactory but during his experiences in civilization this use of himself has become more or less harmful a fact that can be demonstrated so that the end gaining procedure no longer meets the individual's need um, Alexander is making a point is that why are we not trusting to the feed instance to create series of movements? Well, it's because uh, that way of teaching, the somatic teaching, no longer meets individual needs. After my three year training course, I started videoing myself because I, I was uh, organizing workshops and uh, I wanted to have videos of what was happening and I started to look at my uh, way of placing the hands on my pupils and it was uh, it, it was unbelievable I felt uh, I, uh, it was very near the end of my training course in fact it was uh, f just a few years after my training course and um, I had a, a confidence in my capacity to put my hands on people and, uh, and order uh, myself to lengthen and widen, to direct the head forward and up, and uh, to have the neck free. And this confidence came from the fact that my sensory appreciation had, had been reeducated. I could feel more or less what I was doing, and I that therefore could know somatically what it is I was doing. I was in the same uh, league as uh, other teachers. Uh, some teachers, they think I'm pointing the finger at them. In fact, I was pointing the finger at myself. It was, uh, it was much more, uh, well, uh, harmful in a way, but necessary. I started to discover that despite all that confidence, that somatic confidence that I had gained, that uh, I thought I was uh, like a superior, superiorly organized person, uh, when looking on the video, suddenly I came back to earth. And I started, to, I started to realize that uh, in the matter of uh, giving directions, in the matter of uh, obeying orders of movements, I was a, t a total beginner. I'd, I've never learned that in my training course. And so uh, going direct for uh, the result, uh, going direct for an end, it's just uh, for me trusting to the feeling sense. It's like um, you don't uh, you don't realize which are the movements which coordinated together can lengthen the torso. You just uh, observe on film that you are shortening. You just observe on film that you are hollowing the back, that you are uh, protruding the abdomen, uh, unduly lifting the front part of the chest. All this is there, but uh, you don't know from, from where you can. You, you have repeated uh, head free, neck forward, and back to lengthen and widen for, for months and months and years. And uh, suddenly the result uh, is in front of your eyes and uh, you, you have to think about it. You have to think, well, in order to obtain this wrong shape, of course, uh, there are movements. You, you don't arch the back. Uh, many people think that you arch the back because you tighten the muscles. No, you arch the back because you have certain movements that occur between the chest and the pelvis. If you rotate the chest and the pelvis, you can create on on demand. You can create that shortening. Well, now it's uh, it's uh, it's necessary uh, to get out of the trial and error plane. I want the back to lengthen and widen. I hope to. I, I will trust to what I felt during my uh, manipulation hours. I've been manipulated time and time again, and I will trust to that to, to find that uh, automatic lengthening of the back. Well, it doesn't happen. 
<laughs> it's very simple. It's, it does not. For me, it did not. I've been starting to, uh, and from that moment, I started to look around. And uh, Alexander talks about the unintelligent method of trial and error. Yes, it's, it's the method of comparing the result of the present effort uh, that is guided on a subconscious basi basis onto the memory of uh, an experience of feeling you had when somebody was uh, manipulating you. This is absolutely unintelligent. And you cannot trust what you have felt at that, at that moment when you were manipulated by the teacher. And you cannot trust what you feel now because when you were manipulated by your teachers, uh, you never had an idea of the movements of the parts that had to be coordinated in order to uh, improve. And um, uh, there, there are other difficulties also. So. Uh, going direct for an end, well, now it becomes uh, a bit clearer when, when you have this uh, perspective, of course. I'm trying to share my screen. That's it. So I'm talking back, I'm going back to the sentence. He says it will be seen, therefore, that end gaining involved the conception of the pr and procedure of going direct for an end. So, uh, what is going direct for an end? When when you do something in in, in this uh, in this idea or perspective of uh, what to explain what we mean by learning to do. Well, uh, going direct for an end is uh, simply trusting to the feeling sense for the performance of the movements of the parts of the torso. Going direct for an end means that uh, you are still not conscious, not aware, not capable of describing the movements of the parts that are creating the unwanted result. There is an unwanted result. There is a, an hollowing of the back. There is an arching uh, of the spine. There is uh, uh, this idea that the neck is really tense. And uh, we, cannot, we cannot really say or narrate uh, what are the causes of this result. We are just now trusting to a sentence, let the back lengthen and, la and widen. And uh, this sentence has only, uh, well, the additive meaning, somatic meaning that has been given to it by the repetitive manipulations. But when the teachers manipulate, they, they are not even aware that they, they are manipulating movements. What they do with their hands is they, they manipulate parts. In the very beginning of his uh, writings, Alexander used the word manipulate or the verb manipulate in a totally different sense, a, di a totally different meaning. For him, uh, he manipulates the air. He manipulates uh, the uh, the voice box, for example. To manipulate means to uh, consciously direct the movement of the mechanism. And so, uh, nowadays, when we, when we trust in manipulation, it's the manipulation, the physical manipulation of the teachers that are placing their hands on their pupil and guiding them into the proper shape. They, they do not get, uh, give uh, an idea of the separate movements of the different bony parts that are necessary to obtain the shape. No, no, no. Uh, so, in the end, the students and also the modern Alexander teacher trust to the feeling sense for the performance of these movements. So, the means whereby uh, are, in fact, the movements that create the, the shape or the lengthening or the shortening. These are uh, also for Alexander means whereby also means a secondary meaning is the orders that you could give yourself if you were conscious of these movements. Yes, if you could represent these movements for yourself. And if you could represent how these movements are going to concur to obtain either the wrong 
position of the mechanism of the torso or the correct lengthening and widening position of the torso. So most people have uh, no idea when they reach forward with their hands or when they go into sittings of uh, which are the movements of the different parts of the torso that we want to see. Learning to do by the procedure of the initial Alexander technique is uh, is not uh, learning to move this and move that and move no uh, of course we want to see definite movements no learning to do by the process of the initial Alexander technique as I teach it is learning to recognize that the shape of the torso during and after the procedure is fundamental and that this shape it cannot be obtained by wishing. You have to analyze the different movements. For each student, it's different. We analyze the movements which are creating the unwanted result that is seen. So, uh, Alexander says that there are means whereby obtaining an incorrect shape and organization. And there are also the possibility, of course, to to reason out new and improved means whereby orders of movement uh, and this uh, would necessarily involve change in the manner of use of the self. So learning to do, yeah, learning to do by this procedure where you are not too much concerned about going from standing to sitting, but you're concerned about which movements you are seen performing while going from standing to sitting and uh, the result of this movement being uh, the organization of the mechanism of the torso. Learning to do by this procedure is not learning to do exercise on a trial and error plane. You're not trusting to the feeling sense either to guide the movements and you're neither trusting to the feeling sense to in fact evaluate whether the performance has been uh, performed correctly or not. You, what you feel uh, is not important. What is important is uh, uh, not the subjective impression and appreciation. I, I feel I am, I am free. I feel or I tell myself I am free. Uh, no, uh, it's uh, trusting to the control of ocular demonstration. It's when you look at the image, at the film uh, can be in fact uh, stopped image by images and you, you will see whether during the procedure of going from standing to sitting or otherwise from sitting to standing, you will see whether you are uh, well performing the correct movement as ordered. Yeah. And so a person who learns to work to a principle in doing one exercise, let's say that uh, going from standing to sitting is one exercise, working to a principle is not how you uh, sit, how you know uh, the, the procedure is, are you capable of following, obeying uh, instructions, instructions of movements, yes? which uh, are going to produce a result, a back to lengthen and widen, a neck that is free, a head that is obviously more forward and up than it was before. So uh, in all this, you must have in mind that what Alexander is writing can make sense, can be, can be understood, yeah? Uh, we can uh, always take the sentence again and think, what is this sentence meaning for me? When you read a book, you have to, uh, to, to, to produce a, a meaning. Uh, the meaning is not in the, in the text, uh, as if it's not uh, overt. It's not easy to understand what Alexander is saying. You, you must construct this understanding. So, yes, uh, what you are listening to here is my construction. It's my construction about the text. It's not, uh, you, you don't, when you, when you read that sentence, learning to do by this procedure is not learning to do exercise on a trial and error plan. Why, what does it mean? 
Well, it means uh, that you have a procedure where there are two steps, one step of conscious guidance and one step of conscious control. In the conscious guidance, it's what I call step A. You have to order the conscious coordination of the movements of the different bony parts of the torso. It's, uh, it's like uh, central. Learning to do is not learning how you should first of all place your fingers or, or what is the quality of the hand when you reach a person. What is No, no, no. It's not, nothing of this. It's uh, to see whether you can order the conscious coordination of movement of the part of the torso and the hands are uh, an expression of that coordination. In that sense, this is not engaining. In that sense, this is the means whereby principle. And second, what I call B here, um, you must understand that it's not sufficient to order, to order movements, to order a correct series of movements. Uh, you will discover that uh, when you order a correct series of movements, first of all, you're never sure you're order ordering all the correct movements when you're performing. It's very, very easy when you are starting to perform uh, coordination of movement as ordered before, that you will suddenly be uh, taken by feeling that is happening while you're, let's say you have to project four movements. Yes. But while you are starting to project the four movements in going to sit, then suddenly you feel, you suspect that one of the four movements is not happening uh, correctly, is not uh, performed sufficiently or performed too much. It's at first you will not be capable of inhibiting the desire to change that movement. And if you do, what you will see on film is very interesting. As soon as you turn your mind toward one of the means whereby, all the others disappear and are immediately replaced by your habitual coordination of movement to support the new movement you want to improve. So instead of following the procedure, you suddenly have reverted to the old system of trusting to the feeling sense for three of the movements while directing consciously one. This is not the principle. It's something that must be accepted. We are all a uh, victim to this habit of mind and it's necessary to look at it. It's necessary to point to it and to play again to start the procedure all, uh, all, all over again in order to discover how we can project several orders at the same time without being affected by the feeling that is going to, uh, to come because of these, uh, of these movements. And so when we control, uh, we control not by feeling, not by the subjective impression of our appreciation. I felt quite light. I felt quite free. Oh dear, I am moving with... Uh, I feel that I'm moving with ease. Fine. Uh, you're, you're of course, allowed to feel everything, to feel anything you want. You can make yourself, you can suggest how you want to feel. I feel free, for example. You can, you can suggest yourself. But this has nothing to do with the Alexander Technique. We want to control only the objective ocular demonstration of the performance of the orders. Are the orders performed or not? That's all. Yeah. And uh, you will discover that at first, when you start using this uh, new technique of direction of the mind, where you want to uh, direct a number of movement at the same time, at first you will find that uh, the performance is, uh, is not the one we want. So, this is the start of an exploration how to make the uh, action the practice and the instruction the theory work together how how can can we make that bond you know the uh, the, the politician are are very good at well, when they want to get your vote, they will say anything you want to hear. Uh, when they are, well, 
in command, you will find that uh, very often it's very different. They forget easily. Uh, he, Alexander took the, the game of not forgetting. He said, I'm, I'm going to order a few movements together, one after the other, all together. And uh, I am going to check in the mirrors whether I see these movements or not. Uh, is, is there a link between theory and practice? How to bridge the gap between theory and practice? This is exactly the, uh, the motto of the Alexander Technique. Bridging the gap between speech and actions. We are the, the, the center is not, uh, am I breathing well? Am I feeling well? Uh, is my back pain or my elbow pain gone? It's not the point. The point is, at first of all, we are always using orders to ourselves. Uh, you need to do your accounting. You need to uh, prepare a letter. You need to be ready for your next uh, appointment. Everything runs with these capacity of orders. When you are, uh, well, uh, postponing a task that you should do right now, orders are going on in your mind. And uh, you have a difficulty, in fact, uh, making sure that your intents transform themselves and become resolutions, become something of a habit. Yes, the, the, the Alexander Technique is just that means that people need in order to organize their activity, physical or mental. Well, it's, uh, it's very simple at first to use, uh, like we call the physical background of activities, of movements, of gestures, in order to develop that capacity. And that capacity, uh, of course, uh, goes against there are, there, are, there are problems. And the first problem is a habit to depend on the somatic feelings, to depend on uh, what we feel in order to uh, do anything. Yes? Uh, if you feel that you have uh, pain, this is uh, uh, important to you and has a tendency to degrade your capacity to organize your mind and make plans. You're going to be grumpy, you're going to be tired, you're going, and this will affect your intellectual activity. Here it's the same. So Alexander says that the new means whereby are unfamiliar. These uh, uh, movements that we request for obtaining a new result, which is a lengthening and widening of the back, uh, they are unfamiliar. Any attempt on the part of the pupil to carry these means whereby out will be associated with experiences which feel wrong. So that in order to be right in carrying them out, he will have to do what he feels wrong. Obviously, an experience which will be entirely new to him. Look at the bottom of the slide. This is the universal constant in living. This is not the first book. This is the last one. This is uh, 1946. So, uh, well, sorry, 1942, because 1946 is the edition. The book came out in 1942. And so we are told that you have to carry out means whereby means whereby are not going to be uh, happening by, their thems, uh, by themselves. They have to be carried out. This brings us to learning to do, isn't it? You have to learn to do the means whereby. It's, it's no uh, offense. It's no big deal. Inhibition has nothing to do with it here. Yes? Uh, very often in the modern Alexander Technique, the idea is that uh, you need to inhibit doing. You need to inhibit uh, the uh, tension that comes with doing. You need to inhibit trying to reach a certain stage, a certain level. Uh, well, apparently, Alexander is, uh, is very, very far from this modern idea of the Alexander Technique. He says that uh, you will experience the wrong when carrying out. And he says it's necessary to experience this wrong 
and uh, not react. When you are going to the direct uh, series of movements of the different parts of the torso, it's the very first thing that you will discover. That uh, if you direct the mechanism of the torso in the direction of lengthening, which can be seen by ocular demonstration of video recording, at first you will you, you, you will marvel, you will, it's absolutely obvious that you feel tense and you feel um, in such a shape and state that is completely belied that by the video. You, you, how can I feel that wrong when suddenly I am seen on video to be calm, lengthening, uh, balanced, poised in equilibrium? So um, this goes totally against the idea of the somatic technique. What you feel is uh, wrong, uh, untrue, not right. Uh, so Alexander adds, hence when the moment comes when he's called upon to employ the new men's men's we are, means whereby by a new and unfamiliar use of himself, he finds that in spite of it, of his intellectual acceptance of them as best for his purpose is without the necessary sensory confidence to carry out his task a confidence which would be his if he were asked to carry out means whereby that were familiar to him so uh, learning to do and learning to carry out means whereby is more or less the same idea you there is no uh, intellectual difficulty we we don't uh, we don't profess that you should inhibit doing of course you are to do you are uh, you are given instructions and of course at one moment you have to do be, be careful you have to do and uh, w what you see here not trusting to your feeling sense you have to do guided by something else you have to do and uh, you have to understand how to do because most of the time what people do is that they feel they they judge by feeling they just uh, uh, so what alexander points out here is judging by past experience he feels that he's being called upon to take a risk that she should not take i have asked the person to sit on the very front of the chair I have asked the person to send the knees forward and away, away from the back, going back in the second phase of the sitting down. And uh, although the pupil is quite willing to take an ordinary risk in familiar situation, as for instance, the risk of falling in learning to sk skate or ride the bicycle, um, it's not going to be possible to take a risk here. It's like uh, the feeling sense is as, as a grip on the intentions of the person, as a grip on the, the her beliefs. And uh, she will just say, yes, I see that I'm falling back onto the chair, but I, it's my knees, it's not me. I can't do anything. It must be, be something of, of my knees that are not uh, flexible enough or my ankles. It's very strange because at the first uh, we we had to inhibit the movement of the ankle. The person could not bend the knees without bending the ankle, and so now it's a, the, it's a total reverse uh, reversal of the picture. Well, it's easy to explain that. Uh, uh, imagine that every single time the person has, uh, in fact, inclined the torso for, forward in order to sit. The person was not, in fact, performing an action in, uh, like the one you're seeing here, where you see that uh, the torso is behind the knees. In fact, when the person sits habitually, the person immediately reaches the ankle, and you see that when the knees are going forward, you see that the, the lower torso is going forward with it. The person is going away from the chair, wanting to sit. So this is the first stage. But in the second stage, it's exactly what you're going to see here in picture three and four. The person now is very far forward with the lower torso of the front of the chair. So now the person has fear. Why is she, the person lifting the hand in the first movement? It's because the person feels unbalanced. Is that feeling true? 
No, that feeling is, is adjusted to what she is habitually doing. She habitually does the movement of the knees back and the lower torso back at the same time. We want the person to learn a coordination of movement. This is not a complex thing to understand. It's just that we want the person to become able to move the torso backward when the knees are not moving forward. And we want the person to learn to move the knees forward when the torso is not going forward. Here what you see is that the knees and lower torso are going in the same direction. This is dangerous and unwanted. We want the person to learn to have the back back and the knees forward in a way. Which means that we want the person to learn to direct two movements that are opposite to each other. It's uh, the doctrine of antagonistic action. So in our next episode, I am going to, in fact, uh, answer a question that has been uh, sent to us by a uh, student uh, in the world. I don't remember where, in Germany, I think. And he wanted me to explain what I think of another passage of the first book that has disappeared in 1917. It's a very interesting, very, very little chapter called The Doctrine of Antagonistic Action and Mechanical Advantage. Uh, before answering that uh, query, I wanted to have this conversation so that you understand what I mean by learning to do, which is learning to organize the movement of the torso, of the parts of the torso in any activity, and what is antagonistic acts, antagonistic actions. Uh, here you can see between one and two the antagonistic act between the lower torso moving back and uh, the knees, well, staying in place. But uh, you're not seeing another one, which, which is the one we want to see, which is we want to be able to get the back to stay back when the knees are going to go forward which is the opposite you're seeing here. Here you're, you're, you're seeing that the knees are going back and the middle torso is going back with it. Questions or comments? Yeah. Yes, so you mentioned several things about uh, learning to do. So you mentioned uh, working to a principle instead of trial and error. Um, you also said about paying attention to the shape of the torso before and after the movements rather than just trusting to your feeling uh, and also um, uh, working to the uh, working with the means whereby rather than end gaining going straight to the end so you could you could sum up all of these things in learning to do us learning to do things indirectly rather than directly so or or you could say from being reactive to proactive so rather than just reacting to a stimulus and doing things automatically um, the way that we've always done them is to stop, consciously stop and to uh, reason out a new, the new means whereby uh, and then the new way of doing it and then to do it. Uh, and all this involves going sort of indirectly to your end, which it will make the end more uh, effective because you haven't gone straight to it based on the habit. Yes, that's correct. Uh, in fact, um, I'm trying to explain um, how to make meaning of every sentence you've just given. Yes, we, we really think that uh, there is uh, two ways. There is the, uh, the somatic way, where you try to improve the somatic sense and try to make people believe their somatic sense has been improved so that they can uh, perform things with a, a better coordination. This is one way that I refused. And uh, the new way, or the initial way, if you want, is exactly what you've explained. Uh, learning to do is learning to coordinate a series of movements. So this is prior to making the movements, of course. And it's also after making the movements, because you need to consciously control that uh, the movements has been performed according to the plan. So yes, this is the means whereby principle in activity in learning to do, exactly. Okay, perfect. So for everyone watching the video, if you would like to book a lesson with Jean Do, you'll find a link underneath. And uh, thank you, Jean Do. We'll see everybody in the next video uh, where, we'll, where we'll discuss the doctrine of antagonistic action on mechanical advantage. Yes, thank you. Forgotten, Bye. lost, hidden passage.